purchased and you knew there might be a flaw in it, however small, does that plant have a right to existence within your apartment? <laughs> No, wait, 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 we'll let him finish. Go ahead. They, they, we view those things as things that we don't want. Like, I don't, I'm not going to have a tree grow in my apartment, but a tree is not a baby. That's where the art, that's great. That's where the argument turns. We're still talking about things that aren't necessarily people. And in the beginning of the argument, she gives it the right to be a person. So she's got a strenuous argument. I mean, it's a decent argument. The problem is. We're not dealing with the same stuff here. We're dealing with objects. Now, yeah, you can look at a fetus as an object, and she started off saying the pro-choice says, frankly, it is. It doesn't become a person, the law says, until it's born. So she gives it the right to be a person, and then, of course, we have a priority then of existence, of life. What has a priority in life? Go ahead. But like, um, but she does. Ha she does have an argument, though. The couch is in that that you just can't spuriously say, "Well, I have to do something else, so I don't want this." She understands the need of the existence of the of the embryo to have attachment to a woman if it's going to come to fruition, if it's going to be born a person and therefore have full moral standing. Her argument rests, Lord, I'm not asking you to agree to it, you have to understand it. Her argument rests on whether or not a fetus has a right to life at whatever stage, and she gives it the stage of personhood from conception. Therefore, the argument has to turn on whether terminating the fetus or the person is just or unjust. And she presents a variety of arguments. The violinist, Henry Fonda's cool hand, and then she makes the comparison, a thief coming in, or a seed coming in, and where do you come down on this? And she's trying to make an argument for, or defense of, abortion. That the woman has a greater right to life. And she's presenting an argument, people. It's just a philosophical argument. And we're going to have this discussion probably in about three or four minutes. And under what conditions? The pro-life people have to deal with what do you do with rape and incest. One of the arguments is called the sanctity of life or let, the God, de let God decide it. You know, if you weren't supposed to get pregnant, you wouldn't. It's an argument. You could make the argument. And then the other side says it's a violation of human dignity, it's a violation of freedom and rights, and why should I be forced? Because your morals say I have to carry this unwanted, let's say, person, because that's what you think I should do, because according to your moral values, that's what I'm supposed to do. It's an argument that's made out there. We have to deal with the fact it's an argument that's made out there. So she's just presenting an argument, and it's in defense of abortion. She finds flaws even with granting the fetus the right to be a person at the moment of conception. Jada. Real quick, um, just because it's a big issue, but if, like, if, you know, two people are having sex and they both decide to You can make the argument, of course. You can make the argument. That's the problem with arguments, is they have upsides and downsides. Absolutely right. So to help you, when your quiz comes, there's a PowerPoint as well as an e-maze. This is the quick PowerPoint. The case of the violinist, the right to life is not the right to be given bare minimum needs. The right to life is the right to not be killed unjustly. This is the, this is the, the, the heart of her argument. You might be entitled to not have to carry a fetus, and that will not be called an unjust killing. However, if it does have a right to life that exceeds your right to life, then terminating the fetus would be considered an unjust killing. That's the heart of her argument. 
That being said, then I want to have a little discussion with you. And I'm going to predicate this. I've used that word before. What's the word predicate mean? It's, 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 uh, I don't want to be rude or anything. It's like an analog clock. You know, what time does it say? Well, I don't know. Let me look at my phone. <laughs> <laughs> this argument is built upon libertarian political values. Everybody has a right to do what they want to do. As long as what they do doesn't interfere with anybody else's right to do what they want to do. Everybody with me? <laughs> and <clears throat> back at the end of the, uh, the abortion conversation that we had on Monday, I, I wondered out loud if we should update the definition of a person to 23 male and 23 female chromosomes because science has now proved this is the signature of a human being. And I noticed that very few hands went up. Okay, now I'm going to take this back the week before because we didn't have this conversation and I want to make a point. So. And your generation is probably going to be in fairly large agreement with this. Should we accept the fact that some people are gay or lesbian and they have a right to live out their lives the way they want to? They're not interfering with anybody else's rights. And what I did discover was this. I've had some basic instincts about it, but I haven't bothered to look it up. So I will make this post live. And this is scientific inquiry into the fact that genetically there is a suggestion that's growing in scientific evidence that people are predisposed to either heterosexuality or gayness or lesbianness. We're finding the evidence for it. Now it's at its infant stages, but it's beginning to grow. It's called a preponderance. When the evidence gets large enough, we end up with 23 male and 23 female chromosomes. Since the Age of Enlightenment, clockwork science has been in constant battle with the religious precepts of doctrine. And science at times seems to carry the, the day of the argument, and at other times the precepts of the sacred documents seem to carry the freight of the day. It's hard to ir argue with science, but science is not an exact science. Okay, so I always say to the group, I always say, look, <clears throat> Newton was right. We live in a three-dimensional world. The only problem with Newton is he was wrong. He left out the glue that holds the three dimensions together. It's called time. So now we know, thanks to Einstein, we live in a space-time continuum. The only problem with that is Theodore Kaluza came all, along right after him, another physicist and a scientist, and he said, you're wrong. You should have finished the math. We live in a ten-dimensional world, and yet time is the glue that holds it together. And that gives rise to something called string theory. Why don't we see the other seven dimensions? Because they vibrate at a different frequency. We vibrate at the same frequency, and that's where we all coexist with one another. And someone's going to come along and say, Kaluza, you were right, but you were wrong. And they're going to develop the science a little bit further. And the preponderance of evidence is going to grow and grow until it's almost irrefutable. But you can always refute science. It's best guess. And the weight of the evidence seems to make us more and more believable that this is the way it is. So we started this discussion last week talking about how Ptolemy discovered through mathematics that the Earth was the center of the universe. And the only problem with that is he was wrong. And Copernicus, through math, simplified math, proved that the Earth I'm sorry, that the sun was the center of the solar system. And so far as we know, that's right. And it may turn out that the whole universe we see is really like a pinhead, and it is way larger than we knew it was, but we're not hardwired to figure this out. So we give science a preponderance of credence because science seems to be verifiable. So let's go back to our argument about traditional sexual morality versus libertarian sexual morality. There's growing evidence that genetics determine our sexual orientation. How many of you are willing to accept that fact? Now, you don't have to all agree. Some people, based on religious tenets, believe it's a choice. We weren't made that way, we just choose to go down that path. And yet science is seeming to contradict that. 
that we have a right to make our own choices and to live our life the way we want to, and maybe there is a preponderance. Back in the day, we thought alcoholics just drank too much, and now we're pretty sure there's a genetic connection, a disposition to it. Doesn't mean everyone with the genetic, everyone with the genetic disposition is going to become an alcoholic, and it doesn't mean every alcoholic has a genetic predisposition. But the evidence is starting to grow and pretty much point to it. And maybe if we can play with the genetics, we can deal with alcoholism. And so we get into this malaise of argument. Go ahead. Yeah, addictive personality, sure. Yeah, because people who are addicted to alcohol or drugs or addicted to other things, we call it OCD. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm OCD, I'm not. <laughs> so it's interesting that in the social network, and the reason I'm bringing this up in the social network, the argument of accepting homosexuality, being gay or lesbian, is finding some legs in genetics, and it seems socially it's pretty well accepted from a libertarian point of view that people have a right to pursue their own happiness the way they want to. Everybody follow that? I'm not asking if you agree. You know, socially, it's come a long way. From maybe 20% in the 60s, it's 57% now, and it may well get to about 75, 80% before we're done. There's always going to be some group that says no. And yet, on the other hand, there's overwhelming evidence that a signature of a human being is 23 and 23. And so I asked you, well, how many of you would be willing to update the current definition, so the science prevails. And hardly a hand went up. Why not? How many of you would like to update the definition of a human being to 23 male and 23 female chromosomes? Just it's science, people. Why do we let what do we get to environmental ethics? And I point out that global cooling is coming right after global heating is done. It's called the next ice age. Go ahead. Now. Say again? What's the now? Well, the legal definition now is self-aware, self-conscious, rational, with a few exceptions. And look, if we accept 23 and 23, male and female, there are exceptions. There's an extra chromosome that gives birth to Down syndrome. and things. There's always going to be exceptions. But overall, the preponderance of evidence is 23, 23 is the new definition. The biological definition, not the moral, not the spirit, the, the biological definition. And yet I notice most of you don't want to change the definition and update it. The evidence is growing in favor of the genetically, some people are born heterosexual and some are born homosexual. When I say that's a blanket word for gay and lesbian. The evidence is there. Just like the evidence is there for 23 and 23. I mean, do we reject science because it doesn't agree with our moral compass? I feel like at this point in the world, no matter what you change, like someone's always going to complain or about it. They will. But the question to be asked is, what's the right thing to do? I'd like to make a couple of arguments. In favor? Uh, in favor and against. OK. I think what scares me the most personally is, um, and I am undetermined. I'm not going to say I'm for or against updating the definition of person under 23 and 23. But I'm going to link that argument to the LGBT community and I, okay, so here's my argument. Do you really honestly believe, even in today's day and age, that I would choose to be a homosexual? And if anybody in this room thinks that, we should have a conversation sometime. And if you really believe that, what scares the absolute crap out of me, and I'm going to link this to a lot of other things, you update to 23 and 23, then you start to discuss designer babies, then you just start to discuss the elimination of the gay and homo lesbian gene. And everything else we don't and agree with. Else yeah. We don't want to deal we with. We come to the perfect race. We've already tried that, and that ended in a horrible. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. I don't want history to repeat itself. Is it only gay and lesbian, or is bisexual, transgender, and polygamy in that? You know, they